So for the last um, three weeks, we've been journeying through this letter that Paul wrote to Titus. You would remember Tim spoke to us about um, how Titus was told to put things in order, appoint elders. Last week, Regan took us through the section where um, Titus was warned about false teachers, about making sure that the teaching in the church is pure. Um, and making sure that it doesn't get infiltrated uh, by any false teachings. Today, as Paul closes out his letter, he gives us a good passage for holy Christian living. Sometimes when we look at such passages, um, it's easy for us to try and measure up ourselves against these passages and think, oh, you know, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not measuring up, I'm not making it. You know, I'm not, I'm not there yet. And um, that sort of doubt is the doubt that the devil is going to exploit. That's what he's waiting for. He's waiting for you to think you're not worthy. He's waiting for you to think you're not a good enough Christian. Um, and so as we look at today's verses, the thing I want to encourage you to remember is that this is a passage indicating to us what our life should be like when the Holy Spirit is working in it. But not only that, we need to remember that God has, like the song says, enough mercy to, over, to, to cover over our sins, to take our sins away from us, just like the, the sunset is from the, from the sunrise. And so we need to remember that um, while it's aspirational, right, if we're not there yet, there's still time, right? There's still time for us. Um, so I want you to turn with me then to Titus chapter 3, and just keep your Bible open there. If you've got a marker, just put a marker in, in that, in that, on that page, because we're going to return um, to those verses um, throughout the talk today. So verse 1 says, remind the people to be subject to rulers and authorities, to be obedient to be ready to do whatever is good. And so the remind that um, is used here in the Greek language is in the present tense. So Paul actually was writing something along the lines of keep reminding the people, right? And you'll see that, that the first part of this chapter is broken up into these various reminders that Paul gives to Titus as he closes out his letter to Titus. Uh, and the first thing he reminds uh, Titus to do is to tell the people to be in subject to the governmental authorities, the people that God has put in place to rule over them, right? The rulers of the time. Uh, and why, why do we think it was important, right? Why do we think this was necessary? Well, oftentimes the government has a rule that can frustrate us as people, right? The other day I was driving down a road, straight road, it looked, it was I'm assuming a residential road. It was a straight road, and there was sort of no one on it. And I thought, why is there a 60-kilometer limit on this road? I mean, it makes sense that if I was driving 80, I would be perfectly safe, right? There's no one coming into the road. There's very few driveways that lead into it. Um, and I've driven down this road, like, many times before. Um, surely it's safer, or it's, surely it, it won't hurt anyone if I went at 80, right? And, and oftentimes we might be confronted with such situations where it doesn't really make sense, right? It, it's, it isn't, it isn't uh, something that we would have done. And so it then becomes easier then to disobey um, the, the, the rules. But what we need to remember is that our obedience to the government and obedience to rulers that God has allowed, right, to be, to be in those positions, our obedience to those people um, is actually obedience to God. It's linked to our obedience to God. So we can't really call ourselves obedient Christians if we plan um, not to obey the government. However, importantly, um, God is not asking us to obey governments when their rules are in contradiction to what he wants from us. And you'll see the scripture that was read earlier on from Acts chapter 4, uh, and specifically, if we look at the, at the bottom end of that scripture, the way Peter and John answered 
Peter and John said then to the rulers, you know, we, for our part, we can't do anything but preach about Jesus. That's, we are compelled to preach and use the name of Jesus and heal in the name of Jesus, right? That's what, what they said um, uh, in, 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 um, in return to what the, the rulers had told them about stop preaching, right? And so we need to remember that although in our country we are allowed to worship freely um, and, and we are allowed to meet together and fellowship, this might not always be the case, and in many countries it isn't. And so when the government's rules are in contradiction to what God wants, we need to remember that our accountability is to a higher power, our accountability is to a higher kingdom. And so we need to be accountable to God and make sure that we are following God's rules first. Um, and then if we move on then to verse 2, verse 2 says, to slander no one, be peaceable and considerate, and always be gentle towards everyone. So here Paul is encouraging Titus to be peaceable to everyone. Now this is difficult. This is hard for us to, to, to conceptualize because he's not just saying the believers. He's not just saying Christians. He's saying everyone, right? And so imagine if Facebook had this as, as their motto, right? Don't slander anyone, right? Be peaceable, be considerate when you're on Facebook, when you're on Instagram, right? Always be gentle towards everyone. We would have a totally different internet if, if people actually practiced this on social media, right? It'll be a totally different world. Um, and I mean, admittedly, like, we say, like I said when, I, when we started off, um, sometimes we give in to our carnal desires and sometimes we give in to our flesh and we're rude to people. Um, and what we need to remember is that, is that God's grace is there to cover over those times. But this is what we want to aim for. We want to be peaceable, considerate to everyone. This is what Paul is telling uh, Titus to remind the people about. Um, and then if we look at verse 3, verse 3 then says... Um, at one time, we too were foolish, disobedient, deceived, and enslaved to all kinds of passions and pleasures. We lived in malice and envy, being hated and hating one another. And Paul here is saying, so this is the third reminder. Paul is telling Titus, remind the people where you have come from. Remind the people that at one time you were disobedient, you were foolish, right? Right? Um, and and w w why is it important that we are reminded of this situation, w of our prior situation? Um, because firstly, it builds gratitude. It builds gratitude in us because we now remember what God has done in our lives, right? It builds gratitude. It, it helps us to be humble, right? The humility that comes from knowing that something was lacking, God had to work in our lives in order to bring us here, that humility can help us. It builds kindness because as we see other people that may be foolish and disobedient, we now think to ourselves, you know, I also was once there, and so I'm more kind towards them. And finally, it builds faith in us because we realize that there's hope for unbelievers. We realize that there's hope for people that might not be living uh, a Christian life. God can still work in their lives. Uh, but then if you're reading this verse... Right? Foolish, disobedient, deceived, enslaved, and you think to yourself, but you know, I, it's not applicable to me. I grew up in a, in a Christian household. This was not something that I, I was um, uh, confronted with. Right? The first thing is we need to be thankful. Right? We need to be thankful to God that we grew up in a good, have a good background, we grew up in a good household. But we also need to be honest with ourselves, and we need to ask ourselves, is it, does it really make sense that you've never been foolish before? You've never been disobedient before? Right? You were never taken with, with some sort of passion or, or um, pleasure? And, and the, w when we see that, we, we, we realize that we're not as uh, innocent as we think we are, but also it builds in us a gratitude for those that were not born in a Christian household, right? 
So, for example, we might see a Christian and we think, oh, but he's, um, he's still foolish. He's still a little bit foolish. He's not as obedient as I would have liked him to be, right? Uh, but, you know, the journey that he might have had, he or she might have had, um, could be way more and much longer than the journey you've had because you started off from a good base, right? And this person who was an unbeliever, God had to do a lot of work with him. God had to journey and walk with him in order to get him to the place that he is now. Whereas because you started off from a, from a good background and a good base, you didn't have to do a lot of work. And so God has been working in this person's life a lot more, right? And so we need to realize that the, that, that the growth that we see Sorry, the person that we see doesn't always represent the growth in that person's life. Um, we, need to, we need to be aware of that. Um, Paul then talks about how we got out of this situation in verses 4 and 5. Let's uh, look at verse 4 and 5. 4 says, But when the kindness and love of God, our Savior, appeared... So, so, so when did that appear? It appeared when when we are still in that state in verse, in verse 3, right? We were disobedient, we were foolish, we were enslaved. So when, when um, the kindness appeared, in 5 it says, He saved us, because, not because of righteous things we had done, but because of His mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit. So we see, um, j- j- just, just look at that verse, it says, he saved us, uh, his mercy, he saved us, the Holy Spirit. So all of this tells us that we did nothing, right, to receive, we did nothing to receive the salvation, right? Um, w- praying didn't help, okay? Uh, coming to church didn't help, reading the Bible didn't help. You know, all of these things, giving didn't help. These things are evidence that we are saved, but they don't result in our salvation, Okay? These uh, might be outcomes of salvation, but they don't result in our salvation. Why does the, what, what does the verse say? Why, did, why were we saved? It says, because of his mercy, right? This is the reason why we were saved, because of his mercy. And what does that mean, mercy? What does it mean, God's mercy? It means we are not receiving what we deserve. But what we are receiving is something that we didn't deserve. We're not receiving the death, everlasting death, destruction, and, and separation from God. That's what we deserve. Instead, God looks at us, and he sees Jesus' sacrifice. God looks at us, and he sees the ransom sacrifice, right? And, he, and, and, and then he, he, he treats us as if it was us that sacrificed our lives, right? And so we see that we're benefiting so much from Jesus' sacrifice in that, in that time. Also, the, the next part, the part B of verse 5, talks about the, the washing of rebirth, right? And so many, many people might point to this and, see, and say, you see, baptism achieves something. You, you're not, you don't have salvation until you're baptized, right? And that's not what Paul is talking about here. Paul is clear in that the baptism or the washing that he's talking about comes from, at the end of the verse, the Holy Spirit, so this washing is happening as a result of and because of the Holy Spirit, right? And so we see baptism, uh, physical baptism, water baptism that we practice, for example, in this church and that we'll have next week, that is just a symbol of something that has already happened spiritually within us, okay? That's just a depiction of what has happened within us. That uh, water baptism is not salvation, Right? It's not our salvation. We, aren't, we, don't, we don't receive salvation because we are baptized. Right? It's simply a symbol of what, what has already happened. And it's important. It's an important symbol. I mean, it reminds us that we were at once sinners. Right? It reminds us that we are born again. We are renewed. Right? It's an important symbol, but it still is just a symbol. Um, like we read then in... 2 Corinthians verse 5, specifically looking at, at 17, we are a new person, right? And, and how much more, how do we need to act now that we're a new person? What do we need to do now that we're a new person, now that we're reborn, right? And that verse was telling us we need to act as if we're reborn. Imagine 
you got up in the morning and you said, I'm a new Christian. How do I live my life this day, right, as a new Christian? How can I change the day to represent my newness, my newness in the Holy Spirit? How do I change? What do I say? What do I do? You know, we, it, th that sort of uh, behavior would, would teach us, right, about doing everything every day differently because we are new creation, because God has gifted us this new life. Um, so then if we move on to, to verse 6, uh, where we learn about how we're justified, in verse 6, verse 6 reads, whom he poured out on us graciously through Christ Jesus our Savior. So who, who, are, who is verse 6 talking about? It's talking about what we ended off in verse 5, the Holy Spirit, right, has been poured out graciously. The ESV version says richly, right? God hasn't just given us one or two drips of the Holy Spirit. We, we, we're overwhelmed with the Holy Spirit. We are, we are washed. We are soaked. Yesterday, we were at um, Mall of Africa, and we were seeing these little kids running around in, in the fountains, and uh, uh, it was only a few minutes between, before all the kids were soaking wet, right? And, and that's, what's, that's what's happened with us. We are like the little kids running in the, in the fountain of Holy Spirit. We are soaking wet with Holy Spirit. I don't know how they got home um, <laughs> after that. But, but, um, but yeah, so we receive lots of Holy Spirit. Um, why do we receive that Holy Spirit? Let's see in verse 7. So that... Right? This is the reason why we're receiving it. So that, having been justified by his grace, we might become heirs having the hope of eternal life. Right? So we've been given this Holy Spirit, and this Holy Spirit has justified us. Right? That word justified is from the legal uh, fraternity. Right? Um, it, what it means is that we're acquitted. Our sins are taken away. Right? But it goes even further than that. Right? It goes more than that. And as an accountant, you know, I, I, I sort of think in, in debits and credits. Um, we've, we've been credited. It's been added to our account. Our bank statement is now higher because not only have, has our sin been removed, right? And that's the justification part. But also in this sense, in the way Paul is using it here, we've been credited with, right, the blood of Jesus Christ. It's been added to us, Okay. So we, we're not only um, uh, um, increased because of a reduction in sin, we also increased because of this new sacrifice that has been given on our behalf, right? Um, and so what we need to understand also is if, if, we, if we look at these verses, obviously they, they, it's, it's one letter and so it's all written, we see that again he brings up this point of heirs. And so what... What, what, why is heirs important? Why, why, so if you, if you look at an heir to a kingdom, right, it's generally not the person that fought the war. Right? It's generally the child of the person that fought the war. Right? It's not the king that, that created the kingdom. It's generally the child uh, or the relative uh, uh, of the person that created the kingdom. And similarly, we were not the one that fought the war against death. We were not the one that fought the war against the devil. We are simply, we are simply Jesus' children that will receive the, the spoils of his war that he, that he took, you see? And so th this is why that use of the word heirs is important. We didn't fight and gain earthly life. It wasn't something we did, right? Jesus did it for us. Jesus did it for us. Um, and so what does this mean? Let's, let's then read verse 8. It says... This is a trustworthy saying, and I want you to stress these things so that those who have trusted in God may be careful to devote themselves to doing what is good. These things are excellent and profitable for everyone. So here, this is another reminder to Titus. This is what you should be talking about. This is what you should be preaching about. Right? Remind the people that because they are saved, they now have a responsibility. What is their responsibility? To be excellent and profitable, right? They need to, they, they need to do these good things, okay? And sometimes we read this and we think, you know, this sounds a little bit like James, like James' letter, right? Because James went, 
through um, you know, a lot of stress to try and talk to us about the actions that come from salvation, the actions that come from faith, right? Uh, and here it, we might think that James wrote something about this, and, uh, but what you'll see in Paul's letters is that Paul always says, you know, this is, uh, um, you, you received this salvation, you received this faith, not because you did something, right? You were gifted these. You, he's very uh, strong on the fact that you were gifted it. So what we see is that James now often is talking about the nature of salvation. What happens? What is the result? What is the outcome of salvation? You're going to do good works, right? Paul is also talking about salvation, but he's looking at it from a different standpoint. He's saying, you did not do anything to receive the salvation. You uh, um, uh, uh, were gifted the salvation. So they're talking about, they look at the same topic from different angles, right? One is talking about the nature. One is talking about how did you get there. Um, and so it, we need to think of it like a horse and a cart, right? The horse, horses don't push carts, right? They pull carts. So we don't want to have the cart in front of the horse. We don't want to say, oh, you know, I went to church every day, and so that is why I'm saved, right? I helped the person on the street, and so that is why I'm saved. That's not what happens. What we need to understand is that faith and salvation arrive first, right? And they pull along, so faith and salvation being the horse, pull along the cart of good works, okay? So that, that's what we need to understand from that verse. Let's then look at verse 9. It says, But avoid foolish controversies and genealogies and arguments and quarrels about the law because these are unprofitable and useless. Warn, dis, uh, divisive, warn a divisive person once and then warn them a second time. After that, have nothing to do with them. You may be sure that such people are warped and sinful. They are self-condemned. So now, Paul now is telling uh, Titus, don't waste your time, right? Don't waste your time getting into arguments about uh, nitpicking about small things, right? E even though it might be things that, that you might view important in the scriptures or in, in, uh, in, in your ministry, don't, get, don't worry, don't nitpick with people because as you continue to nitpick and point out things, you actually become an irritation to the congregation. He says you become a divisive person, right? So we don't want to waste our, time, uh, waste our time irritating other people in the congregation and worrying about minor things. Uh, what does Paul say we do with divisive people very quickly? He says that we warn them once, right, in, in love, in kindness, in graciousness. We warn them, we sit with them, we reason with them. Um, and, and, you, and you need to talk to them and, and understand why they're doing this and help them to, to, to correct their thinking. And then what do you do? You do it again, right? Again in love, again with graciousness, again with kindness, right? And then after that, don't do it, have nothing to do with them. Leave the, let them alone. Uh, because why? Because these people are condemning themselves. They're self-condemned in front of God. Right? They're creating a, a problem for themselves. They, they're basically convicting themselves in front of God. So we want to leave um, those people alone. So then, this is how Paul now closes out his letter in verse 12. So now he's getting, he's getting to the end of his letter. He's trying to close it out. He says, as soon as I send Artemis or Tychicus to you, do your best to come to me in Nicopolis because I have decided to winter there. Do everything you can to help Zenos the lawyer and Apollos on their way and see that they have everything they need. Our people must learn to devote themselves to doing what is good in order to provide for urgent needs and not to live unproductive lives. Every, everyone with me sends you greetings. Greet those who love us in faith. Grace be, to, grace be with you all. So we see Paul says... You know, I'm, uh, I'm, at the time of writing, I'm going to send either Artemis or Tychicus. He doesn't know who he's going to send, right? It could be either one or it could be both of them. I'm going to send them to you, and they are going to take on this challenge of uh, w what we saw in week one of, of uh, setting things in order, you know, making sure that there's elders and getting rid of the false teachers, which Regan taught us about last week. So they're going to do that, and then you need to return to me in Nicopolis. And this brings up an important point. Sometimes the Lord can put us in a place and our ministry can be for a lifetime. 
we can be there and just, and just that's all that, that the Lord wants us to do is, is be in this church and minister in this church for a lifetime. But often, this is what happens. Often, the Lord puts us there for a season and then moves us away. We need to be happy. We need to be um, um, understanding of the fact that the Lord has his reasons for moving us. And so just like this, Paul says, after I send these people to you, you come to me, and then we can decide how best to use you in the church again, right? And so we need to not be despondent when these types of changes happen, right? We need to understand that the Lord has a plan for us. Verse 13, um, do everything you can to help Zenos the lawyer and Apollos on their way and see that they have everything they need. So you, these two men, Zenos and Apollos, were, were probably the men that brought the letter to Titus, right? And so what we hear here is that um, these, give them as much as, uh, as you can, give them a place to stay, give them um, uh, 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 some food, make sure that they've got enough uh, money to get back on the ship and do whatever else tasks Paul has given them. Um, and so this type of uh, behavior of taking care of missionaries is something that is well established in the scriptures. And so you see, that's why at FBC we take care of the missionary. We try our best to take care of the missionaries. Uh, this sort of um, idea that you need to do everything you can is the idea of a common fund. You have this common fund where you need to help the missionaries out, those that are out there preaching and ministering. Uh, when they need help, you need to go and, and assist them and help them. Right? And so this is what uh, Paul is, is setting in order there. And then in verse 14, and this is the important part, this is the part that, that uh, we need to remember as we leave here today. It says, our people must learn to devote themselves to doing what is good in order to provide for urgent needs and not to live unproductive lives. Right? Paul there is emphasizing, this is the last reminder, remind the people to help those that are in need. Right? Whether it be the missionaries, whether it be someone else who is in need. And in South Africa, there's, there's a lot of people in need. Right? Rem he's reminding them to go and help the people that I need. Whether it's spiritual, physical, whatever sorts of needs they have. If they're in urgent needs, we need to go out and help them. Right? Why? Because if we don't do that, what does Paul say? We're living unproductive or unfruitful the ESV version says, unfruitful lives, right? And so the question is, are we, can we honestly say when we're standing in front of God and, and doing an introspection, can we say that we are living productive lives? What can we do today to live a more productive life? What can we do today to live a more fruitful life, right? And so this is, this is the question that, I, that I'd like to leave you with. Um, is, is, is how, can we, how can we make sure that as we mature as Christians, we live a more productive, a more fruitful life? Because as Paul says towards the end, he greets those who love them in faith. And so Paul uh, um, uh, focuses in and says there are specific people, right, that he wants to greet only in, 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 in the, in the um, congregation. It's important that we... A living productive lives, we would be part of those people that are with him in faith. And so we want to ask ourselves that question. Um, so, now that we've looked through all of Titus, it's, it's, a, it's a short letter, but a, but a sort of a, a rich letter, a letter full, a letter full of, of, of guidance. We see that um, we need to put things in order, we need to, we need to um, uh, Appoint elders. We also need to be aware of false teachers. And then finally, in this last section, we need to attempt to live productive lives. Uh, like, like we heard in verse 2, we want to be uh, uh, you know, gracious. We want to be considerate. We want to be gentle in our interactions uh, with, with, with people. Okay. Let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, dear God, we come to you now and we ask, Father, please, that you um, bless us today. Father, we pray that you may revive um, productive lives in us. Father, we, we pray that you may revive your church so that it continues to be productive. Father, we ask you that you may 
help us to identify ones who have urgent needs. You may help us to identify ways in which we can help these people. God, we pray that um, our lives may be found uh, as a sweet-smelling odor to you. Lord, we pray that we may be found to be worthy of you, and we thank you, Father, for the salvation that you've given us. As we've learned, it's nothing that we've done, nothing that we could have done uh, to gain salvation and faith from you, and so we thank you, Father, for, for this gift that you've given us. We pray this, Father, through um, and, and because of the ransom sacrifice that your Son gave for us on the cross. We pray this. Amen.